Hello everybody and welcome back to another Quick Dwarf Fortress tutorial. In this video we're going to be covering character creation in Adventure Mode. Now, when you start Adventure Mode, it requires you to load up a save file, and by that I mean a generated world. So, before you load up for an adventurer, what you're going to want to do is generate one. So if you haven't already done that, please do that before you watch this video. When you click on the Adventurer button, the calendar is going to move forward by two weeks, kind of letting the game's simulation tick forward a little bit. Now we're presented with three different modes and three different difficulty options. Ordinary, basically nobody knows who you are, you're a complete nobody, and you move through the world as such, maybe eventually earning fame and fortune, or alternatively dying a nobody. Heroes, some people will know who you are, but it's not going to directly give you information. It's going to give you a little bit more leeway to kind of get things going, but it's a bit more of a known entity. Now, the Chosen, which is where a god will talk to you, or a supernatural creature will discuss with you, be essentially being the child of a god, well, that's not in the game yet. I will do a video on that specifically when that is released. Then down here, you have three different difficulty options. These used to be referred to as Peasant, Hero, and Demigod in older versions. However, now they are referred to as Hard, Normal, and Easy. These don't actually change the difficulty of the game at all, so I think it's a little bit deceptive. What it does do, as it states here, is it affects the starting skills and equipment. Essentially, easy giving you a lot of points to spend on gear and skills, and hard giving you very few. Meaning, you'll be so weak that if a chicken look as looks at you funny, you might lose in a wrestling match. We're going to start off with normal, on the hero, for this tutorial. Once you move forward, you are then given an option of who you would like to use to settle. We have a chinchilla man, a cougar man, a dwarf, an elf, a goblin, a human, a warthog man, or an intelligent wilderness creature, which is of course all of the various animal people that exist in the world. All of the characters that you select, you will see different places on the map blinking, essentially indicating where you can start. To explain, if I select a dwarf, any civilization with dwarves that are integrated in so into society will give us the option to start there. So this dwarven civilization, this dwarven civilization, and this human civilization from the looks of things, and these little fortresses up here. If I select an elf, there are many different elven factions that I could be a part of, as well as some human factions we could be a part of. If I select goblins, well, there's of course the humans down south and the humans and dwarves up north, and if we select humans, well, there's a little bit of everything. We've got some more human civilization settlements down here, some humans scattered around up here, as well as some humans up north. Before we move on, I just want to cover some pros and cons of different types of creatures. Goblins do not need to eat or drink, meaning they do not have the issue of starvation or dying of thirst, making them a rather easy start for a new player. Options for starting gear depends on the faction that you're a part of, meaning for elves, they can only start off with wooden weapons. This also applies to anybody who is from an elven faction, regardless of whether or not they are an elf. Dwarves get a lot of enjoyment out of drinking alcohol, and are not nearly as masochistic as somebody like a goblin, meaning they might start crying in the midst of combat if you're not careful. While this isn't necessarily a bad thing, try and keep your dwarf from getting too depressed. And if you want to be somebody who's completely overpowered, locate the largest person you possibly can, such as a moose man, which stands out quite obviously here. And of course, the ever popular elephant man, elephant seal man, or of course, a rhinoceros man. Now keep in mind, while a lot of these animal people might be very tempting to play, if you are going to play as somebody who is likely very small, that also impacts their carrying capacity. Meaning, some of these creatures are so small they have a hard time carrying enough food to not starve to death. Meaning, if you're going to play as a hamster man as an example, or a kiwi person or koala man, you may want to make sure you bring a mount, otherwise you're going to have a really hard time staying alive and also carrying the gear to not starve to death in the wild. Once you kind of decide the type of character you would like to play, for this video I'm going to select a dwarf, you then simply click continue. Once you've done this, you now actually have to select the civilization that you're going to be a part of. So as you can see here, we have the Unions of Mortifying, which, because of the little blinking houses, we can tell they're a human civilization. The Roasted Merchant, which is a fantastic name. This pretty sectioned off little dwarven civilization down here. The Crimson Trumpet, which is, um, oh, I see, there they are. This tiny little dwarven civilization up here with two helixes. And the Colorless Rooms, which is a dwarven civilization down in the bottom right. I think we'll select the Colorless Rooms. Now, just because this is where our character's from doesn't mean all of our characters need to be from this location. Once we finished creating this character, I'll then create a second character as a party member, and that character could be from somewhere completely different and they just happen to know each other. Not all of your characters need to be from the same Civ, so if you're planning on building a party, don't worry about that too much. 
now that we're back on the faction selection screen with our dwarf, uh, we are going to select the colorless rooms. Once we've selected the colorless rooms, you're going to see this screen. Now this screen allows us to do several things. We can swap the sex of our dwarf from male to female. We can rename our dwarf using official dwarven naming, and of course, give them a rude name, such as Bob Afterscum. I've up here named them Bob, and down uh, below selecting dwarven words, I've named them Afterscum. But let's go with something a little bit more apt. Meet Eurist Afterscum, our glorious dwarf. Now you're gonna see several other options down here at the bottom. We have home, occupation, and beliefs. Your home is your starting location for this adventurer, meaning that is where they are from, that is where they grew up, that's where they've spent most of their life. But you select a location, and once you've selected a location, you can then select your occupation, and then you can select your beliefs. So to run through this really quickly, your home is your starting location. Your occupation gives you some starting skills for free that you don't need to spend points on. And this varies from character to character. Now, some skills are useful in adventure mode, while others aren't. But there might be a reason to embark with a bunch of legendary metalsmiths. Let's say you're trying to adventure from a location to a fortress that you've just founded, and you would like to have a bunch of legendary weaponsmiths arrive. Well, this would be a way to do that. You can make a party of five, build them all up to be legendary weaponsmiths in this screen here, and then put the rest of your points into weaponsmithing to increase them even higher. But for the sake of this video, I'm going to recommend that you start off as a hunter, especially if you are new to the game. The reason I would recommend you start off with hunter is because hunter gives you some extra points in combat, and that is one of the best ways to not die, is knowing how to combat a little bit. Then after that, you can select your beliefs or none, if you so choose. Now, your beliefs allow you to talk to your god, which can give you some mood improvements. The reason you would want to talk to your god is it makes your dwarf happy, or your human happy, or your goblin happy, or whatever your adventurer is. Mood is very important in both fortress mode and adventure mode, so it's something to keep in mind. You can increase your, your desired belief in said god, or decrease your amount of doubt in the god, all the way down to the lowest, where you're just a dubious worshiper of your god of choice. And then if you push this all the way up to the maximum, you are an ardent worshipper of your god of choice. Meaning you'd need to talk to your god a lot more, but it might allow you to get along with other believers of the same god. The Great Horned Owl God of Mountains. Which is of course going to be my god of choice. I don't want to be a dubious worshipper, so let's just say that we are a casual worshipper. So I don't need to worry about praying too often, but we'll still get along with some people. Now we are looking at the skill selection portion of the screen. Now before you get too intimidated, I will try my best to make it look less terrifying. Down in the bottom left, we have our attribute points that we can spend. All of these average abilities that we have cost five points. If we scroll down and then start putting points into something, so let's say strength, the next point will then cost 10. The next point will then cost 20. And now suddenly we have superior strength, but nothing else. For this particular dwarf, I'm going to put two points in endurance and one point in toughness. And then a point in strength, and if I scroll down a little bit, let's put one point guistic ability. Now, something that's very important. Memory allows you to remember layouts of locations and the names of people. It also allows you to remember where you're going, which could be a problem if, let's just say, you tend to forget when you sleep. Uh, that could be really bad if you, say, for example, have very low memory. You can also earn points by pushing some of these down, but I would be a little bit careful about that because you might create a character who's so um, thick-skulled that they're incapable of even braining their way through the world. That being said, who really needs to sing well anyway? I know some people will often turn down empathy if they want to go be a murder hobo. Worth noting, at the very least. Now that I've earned some extra points by making myself bad at music, and also very not empathetic, I can increase my kinesthetic sense slightly, giving myself some more awareness of the things around me, and a little bit of disease resistance, because I was once told that this helps me not get infections as badly. Now over on this side, you can see there that some of these skills are already lit up. We have adequate Marks Dwarf, talented Ambusher, and if I scroll down a little bit, adequate Dodger. These are the skills that were given to us because of our role as a hunter. Now, of course, this could be different if we selected as scholar, we would have points in reading, as an example. The tricky thing about skills in Dwarf Fortress is there are some skills that you just can't ever get if you don't know the basics in them. So I would recommend if you, for some reason, would like to read something in Dwarf Fortress, take at least one level in reading, because otherwise you just won't be able to read a book, let alone get started reading a book. 
Other skills, things like musician, singer, keyboardist, these can all be learned within the world. Same with wordsmith. You can just simply start writing things and will eventually get better at it. Skills like tracking are trained very quickly and easily on your own, and swimming isn't entirely necessary unless you plan on fording some very large rivers. Observer is a decent one to start with some points in, because it allows you to notice things er further away that could be a threat, but I personally tend to just put a couple points in a weapon of choice. So for this particular dwarf, I think I'm going to throw a couple points into axe, and then maybe a point into fighter. I'm gonna scroll down a little bit and also give us a point in climbing in case I need to run up a tree really quickly, and maybe a few points in shield shield using, and armor using, just because, you know, you want to be able to block things. Things like uh, kicking, striking, and wrestling are also rather useful, but I'm just going to put one point in wrestling for right now. Carpent, while carpentry can be used in adventure mode, a lot of the crafting skills are not super useful, unless you're planning on sending these adventurers to a fortress. So, for what... For my sake here, I'm simply going to put a few points into Wordsmith, another point into Reading, and then scroll up and distribute the rest amongst our combat abilities. Don't worry too much about being able to train a weapon, as all you actually need to do to be able to train a weapon is find that weapon in the wild and pick it up and start bonking people. Reading is the one unique one that you really need some points in if you want to do it at all. Now that we've moved forward to appearance, up here in the top left we can see our dwarf's icon now. That is what our dwarf currently looks like. Of course, his long beard is braided, his short sideburns are neatly combed, and his very long moustache is neatly combed. We can randomize this without respecting the population information, or just simply randomize it while respecting local populations. What this means is Dwarf Fortress has a very simple genetic system, and this is used to dictate their hairstyle, the clothing they start off with, and the color of their skin, the color of their eyes, and how bad their teeth are. So if I fully randomize, we can get a variety of different hairstyles and beard styles and whether or not they have an afro. And if I click randomize respecting the local population, you're going to see a much more consistent set of options, but you will not get looked at as funny by the local dwarves. Once you find an appearance that suits you, click accept appearance. Now we're in the personality tab. This is a very important one because this dictates what you're going to need to do to keep your dwarf happy. This dwarf really needs to craft an object. They have a strong need to craft an object, meaning they're going to want to bang rocks together and make themselves happier. They also want to argue with people, meaning they're going to want to go up to random people they don't know and force their own opinions on them, meaning that this is the obnoxious guy on the street who really, really, really wants to tell you who he just voted for and why you should vote for him too. They want to stay occupied, which isn't too bad. That just means don't do a lot of the running around in the wilderness without doing much. And excitement, which is great for us because we're going to go bonk things in the head with a heavy stick or axe in this case. They want to admire art, which means they want to look at statues. That's pretty easy. Whenever you see a statue or an engraving, simply look at it by clicking on it and that will satisfy that need. They want to be with family, which is just a sad state of affairs for all adventurers because they have none, and they want to be with friends. And here's hoping we can find some friends. Now we can randomize this if we want. We could try and change our dream and goal, which is crafting a masterwork someday, raising a family, creating a great work of art, creating a masterwork someday, creating a great work of art. Oh, he doesn't want a ma no, no skill? Okay. And then at this point, we can then read the description of the dwarf. This dwarf that we've generated is a complete scatterbrain, unable to focus on a single matter for more than a passing moment. Sounds like me. Deliberately cruel to those unfortunate enough to be subject to his sadism and is unfriendly and disagreeable. He is bothered by this since he values friendship. He is very comfortable around those that appear unusual or live different from himself and he lives a fast-paced life. He has little interest in joking around, and he tends to consider what others think of him. Sounds like a good dwarf. We're going to accept this personality. Now, this might look familiar if you're used to preparing carefully, but this is what our starting gear is. Now, dwarves uh, in adventure mode, sim similar to fortress mode, do enjoy drinking alcohol. However, you're going to start off with some water in your water skin, and they won't be bothered too much by drinking water. Of course, they would like to drink alcohol, but because Dwarf Fortress Adventure Mode isn't skipping parts of the simulation that Fortress Mode does, uh, you'll need to dr eat and drink daily. So something I like to start off with is just a couple extra bits of alcohol and or food just so that the initial starting process is a little bit easier. So I'm going to start with a second water skin, which is going to give us two containers for carrying water around. I'm also going to start off with beer, just some dwarven beer. Now, when we first get through the embark screen, uh, this is going to be in my hand, and uh, we're going to put it into our backpack. Or alternatively, pour out one of our water skins and put the beer into the water skin. Three alcohol is the maximum amount that a water skin can 
hold, so I'm going to set this up to six. Now we do have 233 points to spend. We don't really want to die, and we only have a copper battle axe right now. Fortunately, the search functionality in this is pretty okay. At least at the time of recording, if I type in battle axe and then press enter so that this field is no longer selected, I can then select a battle axe that my civilization has access to. Looks like we have steel, so that is an option to us, but that is quite expensive. In fact, it's more expensive than the points I have. What I can do is I can give myself a iron battle axe, which is significantly better than that copper one. If I want a higher quality iron battle axe, I can increase the quality by clicking on these little stars, or decrease the quality by clicking on the other star. Now we do have a copper buckler down here as you can see, but I'm actually going to remove that, and we are going to grab ourselves a shield. Just an iron shield, nothing too fancy. And I'm also of course going to grab us a helm, but we can't grab an iron one because we've run out of points, so we're just going to go with a copper helm. Something simple. Now, just like in fortress mode, dwarves are going to want a variety of food to eat. So let's grab something that isn't this chopped ibex liver. Why not a couple boiled helm helmet snake eggs? I mean, it just sounds weird to say that they're not boiled. So we're going to grab a couple eggs. My personal, one of my personal favorite snacks to bring on the road. Now be careful about bringing too many things uh, because you can over encumber yourself before you even start. It's also worth noting that this points field down here is for both your gear as well as your mounts and pets. So now that I've clicked on accept equipment, it moves us over to the mounts and pets section. Now there's a few things worth noting about mounts and pets. Pets will follow you, but can be lost in the world. So if you fast travel in a situation where you don't see your pet, you might never see them again. But they might come running to you in happiness after a very long period of not seeing you. Another thing that is worth noting is in combat, they might just run away in fear. And you may think that you've lost your animal, but then they will reappear after the fight, depending on whether or not a dog is war trained, as an example. Larger creatures like donkeys, yaks, mules, and horses can be used as pack animals, so it can take some weight off of your adventurer. And if you happen to have access to vermin-sized creatures, those ones that just kind of blink in and out on the map, uh, they will likely just sit on your shoulder and you'll forget that they're there, until you look in your backpack and find a fluffy wambler. For this particular adventurer though, I'm going to grab us a chick. Now as I said at the beginning, we're going to add a party member, because we have two options here. We can embark, or we can add a party member. This one I'm going to go through a little bit quicker, and you know, every single good dwarf needs protection. Since in real life I am Canadian, we're going to grab ourselves a moose man. Now this moose man has two different places he could be from, the Silvery Skirts, or the Ape of Reputing. Both elven civilizations, as you can see from the blinks on the screen. This is very similar to the situation from before. We can now select where we, where we would like our character to be from. We can also select their occupation which is of course limited because of the fact that this character is of elven descent. So I'm going to select woodcrafter and let's move forward. They don't believe in any creatures or gods or mystical beings. And then we can select their strength just like before. Because it is an animal person, their descriptions are limited. Same as the dwarf, we can see their needs. At some point in the future, I'll do a video on the full customization once that is in. That is a very complex piece of old UI that hasn't been updated at the time of recording. It deserves its own video anyway. And now something that is very much worth noting. When you're creating a character of elven descent, they only have access to the things that that faction has. Meaning this moose man can only access wooden weapons and also requires specific size of clothing. Meaning if you're gonna play as an animal person, you might wanna build a fortress or two in the world that produces weapons and armor for that particular character. So that when they arrive, they can then equip some gear of use to them. But because this lad here only has access to weapons and armor that are made of wood, it allows us to save money and instead spend that on some cool mounts and pets. Elves tend to have some very interesting creatures that can be brought along as friends. Specifically things like a giant tigers, hamsters, and of course, war grizzlies. I'm thinking we bring with us a giant leopard because that's just kind of hysterical. Now that we've so successfully put together our two party members, we're gonna click on to adventure. Now, because we have two party members, we have a choice of where we would like to start. Do we wanna start in the dwarven town of Bend Portal or the elven town of Thing Litter? I think we're going to start in Bend Portal because that is a good spot for our dwarf to begin his adventure, alongside of his good moose companion. And with that, your most trusted companion has made the journey to meet you here today. Let the party venture forth. And that is my very brief tutorial on character creation in adventure mode. If you'd like to see more tutorials like this, check out this YouTube channel. I'm hopefully going to cover as much of adventure mode as possible in the coming days. If you like the sound of my voice, check out my streams on Twitch, twitch.tv slash blindirl.
Thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.